I have given you the overview of uh, nuclear physics and what we are supposed to do in this uh, course. So, as I said nuclear physics has completed its uh, 100 years or just completed its 100 years all started with uh, the Geiger Marsden experiment, where alpha particles were bombarded on metal foils and the scattered alpha particles were detected. And the fact that uh, most of the alpha particles go with little deflection 1 degree or 2 degree or less, but uh, some one odd alpha particle say 1 in 8000 or 10000 suffers such a large deflection that it uh, back scatters and come towards the source itself. And that uh, uh, gave rise to this uh, nuclear model of atom, which Rutherford established or proposed in 1911 paper, that the entire positive charge of the atom is contained in a very, very small volume in the atom placed at the center, and it creates large electric field which is responsible for this large deflection of alpha particles. Since then, nuclear physics has uh, uh, covered lot of lots of grounds and today we have uh, so many applications of nuclear physics and all that. But then uh, it had been a, a tedious journey, the understanding was not very simple uh, because of the small size. And, and the quantum mechanics at that particular level was not understood. So, lots of theoretical work and uh, uh, lots of uh, very sophisticated and uh, uh, experiments using uh, accelerators and all those things have contributed towards the uh, present understanding of the nucleus. So, now I start with uh, the say first uh, group I yesterday told that we will be doing uh, familiarization with nucleus and then nuclear forces and the nuclear models and all other things. So, our first thing will be familiar, familiarize ourselves with the nucleus and in that also I will start with uh, size of the nucleus. How big is the nucleus? The question uh, we are going to discuss is how big is the nu nucleus? And how it is related to the different nuclei, say atomic masses or uh, whatever. So, you have uh, some 300 different nuclei. So, how these radii are related to, uh, to that heavy nucleus and middleweight nucleus and light nucleus and all that. So, that is the question. So, if I ask you, I have this chalk in my hand. If I ask you, how big is this? chalk, what is the diameter of this uh, cylindrical chalk. So, you can look at the chalk and tell me you, an estimate, whether it is uh, uh, a millimeter or it is a centimeter or it is a kilometer. You can just look at this chalk and tell me that it is around a centimeter or so. How are you able to see, say that? This is because light is falling on this uh, chalk piece and that light is uh, obstructed by the chalk piece and allowed by the uh, edges and then that you receive that light, you analyze that light and from there you know that, that the size of this is 1 centimeter. Now, suppose I ask you to close your eyes, so that you do not receive the light coming uh, from the edges or from, uh, from you do not receive the light and I put a sound source behind this chalk. So, I put a sound source here, it will send sound waves and the sound waves fall on the chalk and then the sound waves will go ahead and then you will hear the sound source and I ask you uh, by listening to this sound tell me what is the size of the chalk. So, you would not be able to say that. So, light waves you can analyze and you can from that you can say that the size is a centimeter or 1.2 centimeter or, or 1.5 centimeter or so, but sound waves not. 
So, what is the difference both are waves? The difference is in wavelengths. When we are using light, the wavelengths involved are something like uh, say 400 nanometer to, to 700 nanometer is the wavelength for visible light. And this wavelength of visible light is smaller than or much small, smaller than the this uh, uh, diameter of this top piece. Whereas, if you if you think of sound waves, so what is the audible uh, sound frequency of audible sound? You know, it is said that the range is 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, that is for sound waves, which you can hear normally, normally, unless you have some problem in ears. So, typically take uh, 1 kilohertz. So, if you take 1 kilohertz frequency as 1 kilohertz, 1000 hertz, and speed of sound, you know, speed of sound in air at uh, room temperature would be something like uh, 340 meter per second. So, what is the wavelength? What is the relation for wavelength? Wavelength is lambda is V by nu elementary wave properties and uh, V is 340 meter per second and nu is say 1000 hertz. So, that is uh, 0.34 meters, that is 34 centimeter. So, the wavelength of sound is typically tens of centimeters, whereas the size of this top piece is around a centimeter. So, wavelength is more than the size that you want to investigate and that is why you are not able to get any useful information about the size. Now, nucleus, the estimates from the Rutherford scattering itself is that uh, nucleus is very, very small. So, something like 10 to the power minus 12 uh, centimeter or so, that, uh, that was the estimate of uh, Rutherford. So, light will not do 600 nanometers nanometer is 10 to the power minus 9 meters and uh, nuclear size is expected to be something like 10 to the power minus 14 or minus 15 meters. So, uh, the light will not do even if you go for gamma rays and those things, uh, there also the wavelength will not be that small. So, you need a, a probe, a wave with a wavelength which is uh, of the order of say 10 to the power minus 15 meters or small. And one such object is high energy electrons. A little bit of quantum mechanics coming in, high energy electrons. Electrons have particle properties, electrons have wave properties, electrons have wavelengths and that wavelength is dependent on its momentum. That is known as a de Broglie relation that wavelength is Planck's constant h divided by p. So, if you have in a, an electron with large momentum, large magnitude of momentum, you will expect that the corresponding wavelength will be low. And electrons with large momentum means electron with large kinetic energy and that is experimentally possible with accelerators available, electrons can be accelerated to large energies and then they will have large momentum and then they will have a small wavelengths. So, what kind of energies are needed? So, if I, if I look the relation between the linear momentum and kinetic energy, the general relation taking relativistic effect into account is that total energy including the rest mass energy everything is square root of p square c square plus m naught square c 4. 
So, this is the total energy of the electron taking care of everything rest mass energy and, and kinetic energy and everything. This is the linear momentum and c is the speed of light in vacuum 3 into 10 to the power 8 meters per second. This m naught is the mass of uh, electron and this c is same as this c. This is total energy and the kinetic energy which we control in the accelerators by putting proper potential differences uh, through which this electron is accelerated. This is this total energy minus the rest mass energy. So, p square c square plus m naught square c 4 and then minus m naught c square. So, total energy minus rest mass energy is the kinetic energy. Now, this is the general formula and uh, the rest mass m naught c square for uh, electron is m naught c square for electron is 511 kilo electron volt approximately. So, this is a useful number, you should uh, always remember this. So, in fact, I can give you the rest mass in, uh, of energy of protons and neutrons also, but maybe later. So, this is uh, 511 kilo electron volt, this is 511 kilo electron volts square, add to this and do all this algebra and you get what is kinetic energy. Now, if uh, the rest mass energy is 511 kV and the kinetic energy is many, many times of that. If the kinetic energy is large as compared to the rest mass energy, then what happens? If kinetic energy is large with respect to the rest mass energy, probably you will neglect this minus m naught c square from here. And then again here, since this is large, and this is a small, so this has to be very large and then probably you will also neglect this part and then you will get kinetic energy is just p times c and kinetic energy is almost same as the total energy because rest mass of energy is also small. So, for large energies, for energy or kinetic energy much, much larger than the rest mass energy, if this be the case, okay, I have already. So, for energy much, much greater than rest mass energy, you will have uh, E, which is almost equal to k and which is almost equal to p into c. So, Come back to this uh, wavelength calculation. So, wavelength lambda is h over p multiply c here and c here. So, it is h c by p c and p c is almost same as the energy or kinetic energy. Now, another useful number is h into c. You can remember this h is the Planck's constant, c is the speed of light. And if you multiply these two things, they come out to be h into c is 1240, 1240. You can write it electron volt nanometer or the same unit you can write mega electron volt and femtometer. F m is for femtometer, femtometer is 10 to the power minus 15. So, that is uh, F m and this is capital M is mega 10 to the power 6. So, if you write it uh, electron volt, here we write it nanometers 10 to the power minus 9 meters, but uh, same thing you can write here femtometers, then this is mega electron volts. In nuclear physics, this unit is more useful, in atomic physics, this unit is more useful. So, that is h into c, another number which uh, I would recommend that you remember. So, come back here, the wavelength lambda is h c by e and h c is 1240 MeV f m and that divided by the energy, kinetic energy that you have given. So, if you want to have 10 femtometer as the 
wavelength, what should be the energy? If lambda you need is 10 femtometer, 10 fm, then 10 femtometer is equal to this and this should be 140 mega electron volts. So, if you have 124, 124 mega electron volt kinetic energy of the electron, the wavelength will be 10 femtometers and so on. So, you need hundreds of uh, capital MeVs mega electron volts of kinetic energy to be given to the electron, so that its wavelength uh, becomes comparable or smaller than the size of the nucleus. Now, I will show you uh, an experiment, where electrons of kinetic energy uh, 420 MeV were uh, uh, scattered from oxygen nuclei and as a function of angle, what is the, how many electrons are scattering at which angle. So, that graph is given. So, I will first show you the graph on the PowerPoint slide and then I will tell you what is the meaning of uh, that particular graph. So, let us look at the slide. All right, so, here is this is uh, taken from uh, physical review paper and this is uh, physical review uh, 1959, January 15, 1959, high energy electron scattering and charge distribution of carbon 12 and oxygen 16. So, look at this curve. On the y axis side, this side, it is a differential cross section in centimeters per steradian. Uh, at this moment, you just think that it is proportional to the number of electrons, which are uh, uh, are coming at, at that particular angle. On the horizontal side, it is angle scattering angle in degrees. So, from the initial direction of electron, by what angle, through which angle the electron is scattered and how many of them are scattered at that particular angle. So, that is uh, plotted here. So, what you can see is, it uh, as, as this uh, angle increases, it comes down, it comes down. That means, so uh, most of the electrons are going straight and uh, less number of electrons are uh, scattered at uh, angles and if you are looking for larger angles, you have smaller uh, this uh, number of electrons, but then here you have a minima, which is somewhere around let us say 43 or 44 or somewhere there. So, this minimum occurs at this particular angle 43 degrees or 42 degrees or so, uh, the number of electrons is uh, less and if you look for uh, 45 degrees, 46 degrees, 48 degrees, 50 degrees you find that the number again increases, the number again increases and then it goes through a maximum and then decreases, it keeps decreasing. So, you have a minimum at around 44 degrees or 43 degrees and then it uh, decreases. Now, there are uh, dashed lines and other things, do not uh, worry about that, you just look at the experimental data. These, uh, points with bars, these are the experimental data and you can just see how the experimental data are going, if they are decreasing and then are, they are going through a minimum and then again they are increasing, getting this maximum and then again it is uh, going down. So, keep this uh, picture in mind and then uh, we will discuss the implications. So, qualitatively how the picture looks like, you had this y axis, x axis the angle is theta here and in this side it is number of electrons which are uh, um, are found at that particular theta. So, here you have some sample and then the electrons initially are going in this direction and then after scattering they go in some other direction and this is theta. So, you put your detector at this theta, at some other theta, at that some other theta and for a fixed time you count how many electrons are coming here, how many electrons are coming here and then as a function of theta, you plot that number. So, essentially that is this uh, graph. So, here it is written d sigma d omega, but you just take it number of electrons. 
some per unit time and per unit solid angle and blah blah blah. So, you find that it decreases and then it goes through a minimum and then again it increases and this angle was somewhere around 43 degree or so. And what was the energy of the electron? The energy of the electron was 420 capital M E V and what was the target? The target was oxygen. Now, how do you know that the scattering is from the oxygen nucleus? We are trying to find information about the oxygen nucleus, but then in the sample you also have electrons and these electrons which are bombarded on the sample, they can also get scattered from electrons of that uh, material and they do. But then if an electron strikes another electron, then lots of energy will be transferred if electron or any object hits a much heavier object and scatters from there, collides and then changes its direction, the loss in kinetic energy of that projectile particle is much less. But if uh, something goes and hits uh, uh, equal mass particle from your class 11 physics, you know, if some ball or something, some block goes and hits an equal mass particle and if it is an elastic collision, no internal structure changes, then the first will stop and the second will start moving with the same kinetic energy, the velocities are exchanged. So, the entire kinetic energy of the projectile particle is transferred to the target particle. So, similarly, if uh, these 420 MeV electrons collide or scattered from uh, electrons of the system, there will be large transfer of energy and the electrons that uh, you get in the detector will have a very uh, different energy, very small energies which you can reject electronically and you collect only those electrons which have energy close to this 420 MeV the incident. Uh, so, you know that you are only looking at the energies of the uh, electrons which are scattered from the nucleus and not the electrons of the atoms. So, this is uh, truly for the nucleus alone. Okay. So, now there are two things, in general it decreases with theta, why? And second thing that uh, in general it decreases, but somewhere it, uh, it increases and then goes through minimum, maximum, so why? Now, the first uh, question, you, the answer was given in the previous uh, lecture, it is kind of Rutherford scattering. In Rutherford scattering, the formula derived uh, as I had told earlier, the number is proportional to cosec to the power 4 theta by 2, right. If you remember the number in the Rutherford scattering, what we, what we call Rutherford scattering, the number of uh, particles is scattered. is proportional to 1 over sin to the power 4 theta by 2, proportional to many other things, but theta dependence goes like this. So, as theta increases, this increases and this number decreases. So, it should decrease. Of course, this is not the uh, formula to be applied as such, because these electrons are uh, going with relativistic speeds the kinetic energy is much, much larger than their rest mass energy. So, there will be some correction because of uh, that relativistic effects, but by and large the theta dependence will be something of uh, this sort. So, in general it will decrease, but then the other factor which comes is from the interference or diffraction, you can say diffraction interference of the electron waves. Now, when the electron comes as waves, this formula was derived uh, for a particle, particle particle interaction. So, now the quantum effects are there and the electron is a wave and then if you have a nucleus, if you have a nucleus and this electron wave is going, this is wave corresponding to one electron and this wave is going and it is getting scattered from here. 
So, it is a kind of diffraction as uh, you know if you have light waves and light waves go through an aperture, a slit, then it diffracts the, the wave coming from different portions of the slit interfere at some places constructively and at some other places destructively. So, the interference is, is there. If you want to recall that, let me do that. Remember your optics lesson. If you have a slit, single slit, if you have a single slit of some width and light is coming this way, monochromatic coherent. So, some width is there b, slit width generally is written as b in the books, wavelength here is lambda and at large distance you put some screen and look at the intensity distribution. So, you have maximum intensity at theta equal to 0, that is the uh, uh, wave going straight and then at a point where the diffraction angle is theta, this is the diffraction angle the intensity will be different and how this intensity changes as you increase theta. So, the uh, equation is I equal to I naught sin square beta over beta square, where beta is pi by lambda b sin theta and if you do analysis, this intensity becomes 0 when b sin theta is plus minus lambda plus minus 2 lambda and so on. So, if you plot this uh, intensity pattern, if you plot this intensity pattern as a function of theta for single slit diffraction, you will find that at theta equal to 0, the intensity is maximum and then it falls and then becomes 0 and then again increases and then again becomes 0 and so on. And this is the place where uh, if you plot in terms of sin theta, this will be lambda by b and this will be 2 lambda by b and same thing on the other side. So, wherever b sin theta is lambda or 2 lambda or 3 lambda, intensity becomes 0, in between the intensity is maximum and that maximum intensity also drops if you compare with the previous maximum. So, at theta equal to 0, you have large intensity. That means, in this diagram here, the intensity is, is large, largest and as you are increasing theta, intensity is going down and becoming 0 somewhere, where this sin theta uh, is lambda by b. And then, the next maximum is only about 5 percent of the first maximum. So, this maximum is very small. So, this is uh, the diffraction pattern of a single slit. If you have a circular aperture, the not a slit, but uh, a, a circular aperture and light goes through that, then you get uh, those a bright disk in the middle and then a dark ring and then a bright annular ring with lower intensity and then again a dark ring and so on. And the first uh, minimum that occurs. So, this is for single slit. For uh, circular aperture, you have first minimum at theta, where sin theta is given by not lambda by d 1.22 lambda by d. This d is the diameter of the circular aperture. So, if I, if I just take this formula, take, take this nucleus as uh, uh, giving you a circular aperture of that radius and the wave is passing through that and then you are observing the uh, wave somewhere here. So, this is an analogy, not a, a perfect mathematical correspondence, 
but still it, it will work because after all it is waves electron waves and uh, from the uh, this nucleus they are getting diffracted in different directions and they are interfering constructively destructively all those mechanism is there so basic effect of diffraction will be will be there so if you consider this as uh, providing you a circular aperture through which the electron waves can go interfere and then on the other side uh, you can find the intensity that means number of electrons as a function of theta you can expect that okay at this particular theta where uh, sin theta is 1.22 lambda by d at this particular num theta you will have destructive interference of electron waves and the intensity will drop and similarly the second minimum and third minimum and so on so these diffraction minima they uh, are showing up here so this dip this minimum and then it is going up and coming here so this dip is uh, showing you a minimum so let me do some uh, rough calculations from the position that theta is around 45 degrees because i know all sin cos tan of 45 degrees so at uh, theta equal to 45 degrees the diffraction minimum occurs and treating this as a circular aperture let us see what we can say about the capital d which is the diameter of the circular aperture and in our case it will be the diameter of the nucleus itself so first the energy is 420 mega electron volts so what is the wavelength of this electron electron wave so the wavelength is given by hc by e remember 420 mega electron volts is much much larger than the rest mass of the electron which is only 511 kilo electron volts and so i can use this equation hc by e and hc is 1240 mega electron volt fm femtometer and energy is 420 mev so you can do this calculation it is uh, little less than 3 uh, femtometer so almost 3 femtometer so that is uh, lambda that's the uh, wavelength of the electrons which are falling on this uh, nucleus and then sin theta is 1.22 lambda by d so from here d is equal to 1.22 lambda over sin theta which theta what happens at this theta at this theta the intensity drops to zero so this theta corresponds to the angle where this intensity drops to a minimum so this theta here is 45 degrees so let us take this as 45 degrees so this is 1.22 into lambda is 3 femtometers and divided by sin theta and sin theta theta i take 45 degrees and sin 45 degrees you know 1 by root 2 so this is 1 by root 2 1 by root 2 this is 1.22 into 3 into 1.441 or so femtometers now make a calculation 4.2 here so 4.2 here and 0.8 here it will be around 5.2 femtometer this is the diameter and the radius is 2.6 femtometer this is for oxygen nucleus a rough estimate i have taken uh, all this analogy from uh, optics and i have treated the nucleus just as a circular aperture so it gives an estimate that uh, the radius of oxygen nucleus would be somewhere around 2.6 uh, femtometers or so so this way uh, can you can you expect a second minimum in the single slit pattern you have a minimum when b sin theta goes to lambda and then to 2 lambda and then to 3 lambda here if you think that at uh, Uh, double of uh, this you should get uh, uh, a second minimum you calculate it now you know what is d 
d is 5.2 femtometer. So, you can put that 5.2 femtometers as the slit width and look for the angle at which you will get second minimum and you will find that no, you do not have any angle for which uh, uh, this will be, this will give you 0 again. You, if you calculate sin theta will come out more than 1 and from there you know that you should get only 1 minimum and you do get only 1 minimum. But yes, if you take a bigger nucleus like lead or so, so that d is large and then this lambda by d is small, then 2 times lambda by d, 3 times lambda by d those things will also give you some theta and you will get more minima here or if you increase the uh, energy of this electron, then also the lambda becomes a smaller and that will also allow you to have uh, oscillations on this on this curve, but let us stick to this. Now, this is an estimate, but uh, the electron scattering can be taken further ahead. You can get uh, more information about the uh, structure inside the nucleus uh, from this and for that you have to do little bit of uh, quantum mechanics, because now you are looking at the interaction of electron with the charge density or charge distribution inside this nucleus. Okay. So, I will just outline the steps or the methods and I will tell you the results. So, the electron wave is going in this direction and this is a region where it interacts with the nucleus and then it scatters and goes in some other direction. So, if I write the wave functions, the initial wave function is something like e to the power i k dot r, k represents this direction, k represents this direction and the magnitude of k is related to the energy of uh, the electron. And here, this is the final wave function. So, this state of this electron is changed from this initial wave function to the final wave function, which is e to the power i k prime dot r. This direction is k prime direction. It is an elastic scattering and hence the kinetic energy of the electron remains the same and hence the magnitude of k remains the same and only the direction changes. So, k vector and k prime vector differ only in direction not in magnitude and the magnitude is related to the uh, uh, energy kinetic energy. Okay. And uh, what made this change electron wave function going from psi i to psi f what is that interaction? So, that interaction is here between the charges of the nucleus and this electron and this interaction is just a coulomb interaction. Electron does not uh, exert any nuclear force or strong force or things like that. And this uh, interaction energy, let me write it h prime, this is uh, the, if the electron is somewhere, somewhere here, then the uh, energy will be say rho r prime d tau prime. I will just explain what it is all times minus e divided by 4 pi epsilon naught and then mod of r minus r prime and integration over the nuclear volume. What is this? I am only writing the coulomb energy of electron with this electron with this nucleus. So, if you have a, let me draw it here, if you have your origin here and this is the nucleus, this is the nuclear volume and you take a small volume element, this I am writing as d tau. So, this will be our symbol, d tau is for volume. So, this is a, this d tau prime rather, d tau prime this one and here at this position the uh, uh, charge density rho r prime. What is r prime? r prime is the location vector. 
position vector of this element. So, at this r prime vector you take a small volume element and the charge density here is positively charged, nucleus is positively charged and the charge is distributed in this whole size, in this whole sphere, in what fashion that one has to look, not necessarily uniform that we are trying to investigate what is the distribution. So, charge density here is rho at r prime, d tau prime is the small volume. So, rho into d tau prime is the charge of the nucleus in this small volume. So, that is this part rho r prime d tau. So, this is the charge and then this is electron. So, electron is somewhere let us say here, this is the electron and the position vector from the origin is r vector. So, electron is here, it will be anywhere outside inside anywhere. So, the potential energy, Coulomb potential energy of this electron and this uh, charge here. So, you multiply q 1 q 2. So, this is q 1 and this is q 2 minus e is the charge on the electron. So, q 1 q 2 divided by 4 pi epsilon naught separation between the two charge. That is the potential energy of a two charge system. Okay? Remember that V is q 1 q 2 by 4 pi epsilon naught r. r is the distance between this q 1 and q 2. If you have a charge here, if you have a charge here and the distance is r, this is the potential energy. So, that is what I am trying to write here. This is charge q 1 and this is charge q 2 and the potential energy is q 1 into q 2 divided by 4 pi epsilon naught distance between this and this distance will be uh, this r minus r prime, this vector will be r minus r prime and mode of that, that means the separation between these two is this. This is energy of this electron with this volume element. Now, you take, you integrate over this whole nuclear volume, so that you get the total energy of this electron with this nucleus. So, that is uh, the integration and the integration is on nuclear volume d tau prime so, this is the interaction energy. Now, what is the probability? What is the probability that this interaction will change the wave function from psi i to psi f? Now, the quantum mechanics uh, rules say that this probability of psi i going to psi f is proportional to square of a quantity square of a quantity, which we write as psi i h prime psi f. I will just tell you the meaning. Okay, it is square of this. The probability is proportional to square of this. This is an integration and let me tell you what is this integration. This integration is integration over the entire space and the first psi i star complex conjugated. This is star is for complex conjugated. So, psi i the initial wave function complex conjugated. That means, this i becomes minus i. So, that is this psi and then you write that interaction energy h prime whatever it is and then psi f r and this integrated over the entire volume. Entire volume, not of nucleus, the whole volume. So, that is the, this quantity. So, if you write this will become a long expression, psi i star will be e to the power minus i k r. This is multiplication only. So, I can first multiply this psi psi i star and psi f. So, that this will become i k prime vector minus k vector dot r. So, I have done this part and this part together that is this and that is multiplied by whatever is written there this h prime integration rho r prime d tau prime then minus e 
4 pi epsilon naught r minus r prime all these things and that is it. So, this and then dr finally, dr this integration for this integration d q r rather or d tau write it d tau. So, this is integration on r r vector r theta pi. So, all this thing can be done and from that you know the probability for a particular theta. If the incident beam is coming in this particular direction, what is the probability that electron will be scattered at this angle? What is the probability that it will be scattered in this angle and so on? So, if you know the charge density in the nucleus, the distribution of charge density in the nucleus, then you can do all this calculation and get the probability. Here the problem is reverse. We do not know what is the charge density, how charge is distributed in the nucleus. The total charge is known. The total charge of the nucleus is z into E, but how that total charge is distributed over this nuclear volume. So, that distribution we do not know. If we know that, we will just put it here rho r prime and then we can make all these integrations and get the probability and from that probability we will know that uh, at what angle, what, ex, what do I expect. Here, the data is available. That means, the probabilities are available. As a function of theta, we know how many electrons are going at uh, 40 degrees and how many at 43 degrees and how many at 44 degrees and how many at 50 degrees and 60 degrees and so on. So, those probabilities are known and from those probabilities, we have to get this rho. So, you need something like inverse Fourier methods and all those things to do that, but it, it is doable. And when you do that, what do you get? So, that I will show you on the PowerPoint slide. Okay. So, you look at this uh, slide and this is for three nuclei, this exercise has been done and has been done and has, has been shown here and one is this uh, oxygen nucleus. So, one curve is for oxygen nucleus, another curve is for 118 tin and yet another curve is for 197 uh, gold. And what you see is that uh, the charge density on the on this y axis you have charge density rho p r, it is written here you can see this rho p r. So, this is uh, charge uh, proton, this p is for proton. So, it is looking at the proton distributions, number of protons you can say per unit volume and the volume here is f m minus 3 per me meter inverse cube. So, that is y axis or x axis you have r that is distance from the center of the nucleus. So, it, this is in Fermi femtometers also known as Fermi. So, this is 5 femtometers, this is 10 femtometers and so on. So, you, if you take for example, this gold, this curve, this, this density is almost constant up to certain length and that length would be around 500, 5 femtometers and after that it falls. It does not fall very sharply, uh, you have a, a tail type of thing, it falls and here around 9 femtometer or so, uh, it really, it looks like it, it has become 0. Similarly, for 118 tin, you can see a graph here, this graph here also from the center, it is constant up to some distance and then it starts falling and goes like this. Similarly, for oxygen 16, you can see it goes like this and then it, it falls. So, what do you see from these figures? From these figures, you can see that uh, the nuclear charge density or proton density is constant from the uh, origin from the center of the nucleus up to some point and then uh, it uh, decreases. All right. Why we are calling it proton density and not neutron density? The curve you just you had seen is like this. this is r and this is rho. You can call it charge density or proton density, because only protons have, have charge. 
So, this goes uh, in this fashion. For different nuclei, for oxygen or lighter nucleus, you saw the graph uh, is something like this. So, at the center, the charge density was more for the lighter nucleus, this was for uh, oxygen 16 okay, and this could be let us say tin 118 and then gold was like this, this was gold. So, lighter nucleus more charge density at the center, heavier nucleus less charge density at the center slight difference not much, but still the difference is there. And this radius up to which the density is almost constant that is of course, smaller for the lighter uh, nucleus and larger for the uh, this thing. Now, since electron interacts only with the protons and scattering is only because of the protons that is why the result that you are getting it is giving you the proton distribution. How about neutron? So, make a assumption that neutrons are also uh, similarly distributed as protons, but uh, you, you have in general more number of neutrons than protons in the uh, in a heavy nucleus at least or middleweight nucleus. So, the total number if I top of nucleons, the total number is A, if I talk of protons the total number is z. This gives you how that z protons are distributed. Now, if I am interested in the mass distribution, total mass, so protons and neutrons both taken together, what do I do? I have to scale it up. From z, I have to make it a, the total should become a. And so, the mass density rho, if this I say proton density, then uh, and this is the total mass density of the nucleus, then this should be rho p times a by z, you have to scale up, you have just multiply by this. Okay. So, uh, so, total should be a not z, if you are talking of mass. So, you multiply everything by this uh, a by z. Now, a by z this number is different for uh, oxygen and different for tin and different for 197 gold. For uh, oxygen, it is just 2, A by Z will be 2, total A is 16 and the proton number is 8. So, A by Z is 2, you have to multiply it by 2, but here the neutrons are more than protons. So, this is more than 2, so you have to multiply this by more than 2. Heavier the nucleus, you have to multiply by a larger factor for lighter nucleus this is 2, but for heavier nucleus it will be more. So, what do I get if I multiply by this, this by 2 and this by something which is more than 2 and this by something which is even larger. If you multiply by this and try to get this total mass distribution, how what kind of curve you get for these three nuclei that is on the next slide. Now, look at it, the same data is the same data oxygen, tin and gold and uh, the same charge distribution that you saw in the previous slide. You just multiply it by A by Z which is different for oxygen, tin and gold and you see that all three this portion becomes almost the same. The mass, mass at the center, mass density at the center, it is same, almost the same for each one. I go back to the previous slide and you see the difference here, you see the difference here for the three nuclei. This is only proton distribution, protons are distributed this way, but when you look at the neutron plus proton total mass, then everything coincides here, almost coincides here at 0.17. So, this is number of nucleons per femtometer cube 0.17 and then you have the general uh, appearance. Okay. So, when you do this and you write how mass is distributed in the in this uh, nucleus, you find that independent of which nucleus you are talking, this is almost the same, slight difference is there, but this is almost the same. And then depending on which nucleus you are talking, it goes straight and then it falls. 
this is the total mass distribution. Mass density you can say here and r, what is r? r is uh, distance from the center. So, that means, it is not that protons and neutrons are attracted towards the center and therefore, at the center they are in more dense, uh, it is not like that. The density is almost uniform and it goes up to little bit closer to the surface and then this density gradually decreases. That means, you do not have a sharp boundary. The nucleus is a quantum system, it does not have a sharp boundary. It is not that the here, up to here you have the nucleus and after that nothing is there. It all gradually decreases, the mass density gradually decreases and goes to 0. And this number which is here, this number rho naught is almost same 0.17 nucleon per femtometer cube or so. So, this type of function can be represented by a function which is called Oud's Saxon function. This kind of shape can be represented by a special function which is called Oud's Saxon function and in if I write in this this will be something like this rho equal to constant rho naught 1 plus e to the power r minus capital R and by a. Okay. Now, in this there are three parameters, one is this rho naught which is a constant and this tells you what is the total mass, if, it, if you are writing, writing in terms of mass, what is the total mass or if you are writing in terms of number, what is the total number. So, that is this thing. Now, this uh, capital R here, this capital R is, uh, uh, is, is this distance, is this distance, where the density falls to half its maximum value. So, that is this capital R and this A is related to how sharply it falls to almost 0. So, that uh, is a measure of A not that this distance is a, but this is related to a. If a is small, that means it falls more steeply. If a is, is large, that means it, it goes uh, very gradually. So, this, these are the kind of uh, the parameters uh, that you get and your how this, uh, this neutrons and protons, how are they distributed in the nucleus? Roughly, this is the picture. So, next class I will start from here and talk more methods to get to the distribution inside the nucleus. Okay.